Hey, this is Joel Deacon from FloridaLinguistics.com. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about morphology, the often overlooked middle child in linguistics. First I'm going to explain what it is and then why people study it, as well as who might care. First, regarding what morphology is, morphology can be defined as the study of morphemes. But for this to make sense, you need to know what a morpheme is. Morphemes are the smallest chunks of sound that have at least one meaning. In comparison to words, words can be made of more than one morpheme. Words are defined by the famous American linguist Leonard Bloomfield as being minimal free forms. This means that they are not bound to other morphemes. They can be separated from their closest neighbors in most cases. Um, so mathematically speaking, what you need to understand right now is that a word can be greater than or equal to one morpheme, while a morpheme can be a word, but can be smaller than a word. I would also like to interject right here that this is a very simplistic definition of morphology. Um, better stated, it, you are identifying, describing, and classifying these things that you determine to be morphemes in language. Furthermore, if you are a little confused right now about what a morpheme is, don't worry. Through the following slides, you should obtain a better grasp. Another way of understanding morphology is by thinking of it as the study of the systematic correspondence between form and meaning. Now, a picture is worth a thousand words, so I've given you four lists here. Um, list B corresponds with list A, and list B corresponds with list C, as you can see. Um, if you take list A here, you have three words and you have the same three words in list B, only they're plural. And you see that the way to make these words plural always is the same morpheme, S. And so we can keep finding more and more nouns in this case, and how do we make them plural? We add an S. And since you have this systematic correspondence, we can see that um, S has a meaning, and um, it is a morpheme, just like cat is a morpheme or dog is a morpheme. This should also serve to illustrate the, the obvious point that a morpheme is smaller than a word, since S is clearly not a word. Now, if you look at list C and D, um, this is why you have to check to make sure it's systematic. If you took a thing like a word like here and you add an H to it, you also get another word here, and it's uh, related. So um, you think, oh, well, maybe H is a morpheme in English. but in comparison with other um, items like nose and tongue, you see that, that H doesn't make a word, these are not words. So um, we can determine that it's not systematic and that this is merely an accident. Now, in the previous slide, when I put the morphemes into lists, what I really was doing is I was beginning to build a paradigm. And in morphology, what we call a paradigmatic relationship is such a list. Um, a paradigm is a list of morphemes organized by linguistic features. Um, I give you three here. Um, C is the most common um, type of paradigm. You're generally putting in more like functional um, morphemes because you can list them all. While like in A, a list of verbs, I mean, that's a dictionary basically. Perhaps a more helpful way to think of a paradigm is think of morphemes like keys, and a sentence is like a row of doors with a lock. Now, um, certain keys can fit in certain locks. You put all the keys that belong to one lock in one list, and you organize a language that way. Now, I mean, with list A, there's just tons of keys because they're verbs. So more commonly, what you see is a list like C, because you can easily list all the personal pronouns in English to form a complete paradigm. And that's often what you're trying to do, um, find a complete paradigm. In contrast to a paradigmatic relationship, you have a syntagmatic relationship. This, going back to the analogy of the doors and locks, would be the relationship between neighboring doors. Um, you're not looking at so much you know, all the keys that can fit in one lock. You're looking at what kind of doors often occur next to one another. So here I have his, the, uh, uh, some. Now, all of these um, can be organized into a list. These are all a similar type of key. 
Um, but their neighbor is going to often be a noun. We expect the noun to follow. Um, we, however, do not expect two of these keys to co-occur. And that way, a little phrase like the a dog is nonsensical. Um, that's because we do not see a syntagmatic relationship between the and a. We do, however, see a syntagmatic relationship between the dog or a dog, where one is next to the other. It is important that you realize now that a syntagmatic um, relationship is in stark contrast to a paradigmatic one. Right here, the focus of morphology is somewhat split. With the paradigmatic approach, you have sort of a vertical focus, while in the syntagmatic approach, you have a horizontal focus. Moving along, I would like to talk a little bit about two different types of morphemes we've seen here. Because morpheme, morphology um, is not just about finding the morphemes of a language, but also classifying um, those morphemes. So going back to our A, B, C, and D list, um, we can see here that I have put in bold the non-word morphemes, while the morphemes that would constitute a single word are not in bold. The um, morphemes that are not words can be referred to as inflections. An inflection is a morpheme that is added to a, um, a word in a given syntactic context. So when a word appears in a particular context, in the case of um, a and B here, we have two, so it's a plural context, so therefore the noun cat gets inflected with the morpheme S. Um, likewise, when the verb walk appears in a past tense context, it must be inflected with the um, past tense ED. Again, we refer to these types of morphemes as inflections. Um, all the inflections for a particular word, like walk, could be um, put in a paradigm and they would have a paradigmatic relationship, while um, the word walk and the morpheme ed share a syntagmatic relationship. This slide here presents perhaps the most abstract concept of the day, and that is the lexeme. Um, on the previous slide, we looked at inflections. Um, those are the morphemes occurring on the right hand side of the words. Um, the morphemes on the left-hand side could be said to come from a lexeme. Now, a lexeme would be the underlying form for these lexical items, or what we've been seeing as being um, minimal free forms. So if we take a, a lexeme like tree, we can postulate that it will have two different surface forms, um, one being singular and one being um, plural. So you have a singular inflection, which is nothing, and the plural inflection with the S. Um, likewise, we could have another lexeme um, noted as a verb, and this could have four surface realizations. When used as a verb, tree can mean to, to chase an animal up a tree. Um, so um, the hounds tree a raccoon. Um, the hound trees a raccoon or past tense, they treat a raccoon, they have treated a raccoon, they are treating right now a raccoon. We can postulate that these four surface forms have come from that single underlying form being the verbal lexeme of the word treat. Um, you could think of it like I have in the illustration there to the right, that there is some sort of abstract idea in your head that can appear as different things, just like the same tree looks different in winter, summer, um, spring, and fall. Um, we have some sort of underlying form in our head that, that can appear um, with different inflections um, given its context. Now, an astute observer might just ask, well, why do we have to have this noun lexeme and this verb lexeme? Why can't we just say there's a, a, a lexeme tree and it can appear as with six different surface realizations. Um, and if you think such a thing, then you are um, kind of on the right track. We're just not quite prepared to tackle that problem, but um, later on we will see that that's the, the right um, train of thought. Okay, first we looked at morphology as being the study of morphemes 
and then looking at how to identify, describe, and classify those morphemes. We didn't spend any time on describing morphemes. That will be for another um, lecture. But the second major point to the definition of what morphology is, is the study of the internal structure of words. This is looking at how languages can create new words and how languages build um, words that um, are more complex. Now you have simplex words and complex words. Um, a simplex word has only one morpheme. Um, a complex word has multiple morphemes, to throw a little more terminology at you. Um, when you look at um, a word like untruthful, uh, you, you, you have to postulate maybe that there is some hierarchical structure to this word. There are two ways to diagram this. On the left I have brackets, and on the right I have a tree. The tree is a little bit um, more viewer friendly. So at the very bottom, we would postulate that um, truth must first connect to full and form truthful before un can attach. That is because there is no word untruth in um, English, at least not, not commonly said. I mean, that would be a good point of argument if one encounters such a word. So you would first get truthful, and then from that, you can attach the um, prefix un and get untruthful. And um, the tree would show this kind of hierarchical structure to the derivation of that complex word. In describing the what, I feel that we've kind of implicitly already um, answered the why question. But I wanted to sum up a little bit here for you that um, the reason we do morphology is that it attempts to explain, again, how words are created being the internal structure of words, um, as well as it, it helps us list out um, the appropriate form of a word given its location in a particular sentence. Um, and thirdly, um, which we have not gotten to in this lecture, um, postulating what governs the use of the correct form, and that can potentially be very, very interesting. Um, so these three things um, are three things, are three goals of morphology. Um, perhaps I've overlooked some things, but I feel like these are three rather simple um, goals of morphology. Furthermore, to make the case for why morphology is necessary is um, by doing these things like paradigms and such, we can get a more accurate description of individual languages. Um, it, it allows for any sort of analysis that you want to do um, at the word level or smaller. Um, it helps us find patterns in human language for any sort of typological hypothesis, um, which can bring up all sorts of things about what it means to be human. Um, it also allows us to um, theorize how morphemes can be organized, and perhaps this does something about our, our mental um, capacity or um, cognitive abilities. Um, if language is related to our cognitive abilities, um, this, of course, is not entirely proven. Um, it's just all um, hypothesis. Um, and understand the flexibility and rigidity of word creation. Um, again, we go back to our mental um, capabilities. Um, some might also say that um, morphology provides a kind of a bridge between phonology and syntax. Um, and from my point of view and bias, it's definitely closer to syntax. However, um, phonology plays a large role in the shaping of morphemes, and um, from the next lecture we will see um, a lot of phonology in um, dealing with the types of morphemes and describing morphemes. Now people who can utilize morphical knowledge, um, one being language documenters. Um, languages are going extinct at an alarming rate these days. Um, doing a morphological analysis of a language provides kind of detail that might be necessary in helping a language revitalize if the people are ever interested in um, regaining a language that might be lost. Um, this would obviously, obviously um, also be interesting to anthropologists, um, especially comparing types of people when we talk about what is a possible human language, um, what are possible ways to create words. Um, it could definitely be interested, interesting to the anthropologists. Um, second language acquisition teachers and ESL, um, being able to do a morphological analysis is definitely helpful for your grammatical explanation of um, certain problems. 
um, cognitive scientist. Um, we did not even talk really at all today about the lexicon, which would be the sort of abstract um, box in your brain where you, you store all these morphemes or lexemes. Um, a cognitive scientist is definitely interested in the, um, the, the way that your brain will organize um, uh, linguistic um, items, linguistic knowledge. Language art teachers are another um, candidate for people who could utilize morphological knowledge. I mean, the writer um, Lewis Carroll, um, a lot of his creativity came off of, uh, you know, his ability to analyze words into their morphemes. I mean, via the, the, the known joke, you know, about people being disgruntled, but you never hear of anyone being gruntled. Um, that kind of analysis is definitely helpful. Um, for the type of creativity that um, language art teachers and writers often value. Uh, when it comes to linguists, I think it should be, go without being said as to why um, a morphological analysis is important for them. And, um, they are concerned with the scientific study of language, and this is one aspect of language, and therefore it needs to be studied. Well, I believe I've had your attention for long enough. Um, for one sitting, anyway. I want to thank you for um, bearing through, and I hope you um, have learned something about uh, morphology and um, how you can analyze language. Um, next time, I'm going to go over um, some types of morphemes and the concept of allomorphy, um, which is dealing more with describing um, the morphemes, which we did not get to in this lecture. Also, um, if you're interested, go to florodolinguistics.com to become a member of the FLA, that's the larger organization that is responsible for producing content that you see at this site. Uh, thank you again, and uh, until next time, this has been Joel Deacon with LearnWistics.com.